Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now, do you know what Article 11 of the EU Cyber Security Resilience Act is? Probably not, but what it says is any organization that finds a flaw in software, wherever it is in their company, must make that public within 24 hours. Now, this hasn't gone down too well uh, with certain parts of the industry, particularly those who work in cybersecurity and those that uh, purposely look for vulnerabilities to aid companies, not hackers themselves, to aid the companies to repair them before they are made public. I caught up with one of the signatories of a letter that has been sent to the EU to try and dissuade them of this. His name is Casey Ellis, and he is the uh, CTO and founder of Bug Crowd. I did a recording uh, with uh, Casey uh, a few days ago, and so let's see what he said. So I'm with Casey Ellis, who is the founder and chief technology officer of Bug Crowd. Welcome, Casey, to my channel. You're my first guest, so I'm very excited. Very um, to be here, Paul. Uh, thank you for the invite. No worries. And um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and, and then we'll go into discussing this uh, EU shenanigans. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, um, you know, basically, I'm the the founder of Bug Crowd. Uh, Bug Crowd didn't invent vulnerability disclosure or bug bounty programs. That was prior up, but we were the first to come out with this idea of basically putting a platform in between all of the skills and all of the different answers that exist in the white hat hacker community and all of the different problems that uh, cybersecurity defenders have. So that was back in 2012, been working on it ever since. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Disclose IO project, which is really an initiative that uh, is working to, to adjust and improve the operating environment for people that hack in good faith. Like I've, I've been <clears throat> a hacker my entire life, um, you know, professionalized that pretty much straight out of high school, becoming a pen tester and, and kind of going forward from there right. from a standpoint. But historically, uh, you know, people like myself who, you know, think bad, but do good. Um, <clears throat> the law hasn't really, frankly, understood quite what to do with this. Um, and a lot of the laws that have been written kind of assume that we're, we're all criminal, which is not not true. So, you know, the, the idea of like, how do you how do you make sure that there are laws in place to be able to prosecute actual crime whilst making life easier for, for people like myself to act as the Internet's immune system and help everyone stay safe online? That's the idea. And of course, yeah, hacker unfortunately is now used uh, generically as someone that's up to no good. Uh, so I understand and a hacker was a, a hacker originally was a, a was a, a good thing and still is in in, in your case. So um, you you were one of the many signatories of this uh, letter uh, yep. about uh, warning about the proposed legislation um, that the EU has come up with in the Cyber Resilience Act. So the the first question is, what are your main concerns or what are the main concerns of you and other experts regarding the vulnerability disclosure requirements in this? Yeah, I think I think there's a variety of different things. I mean, <clears throat> just in general policy, uh, policy doesn't move as quickly as technology does. So so when there's initiatives like this, you know, I, I think it is the role of, of technologists just in general to, to you know make their voice heard. And, and basically, you know, make sure that uh, any kind of tripping hazards that might exist in the policy that's been created uh, are at least acknowledged, if not dealt with and, and removed. So that's that's a, something that I've been involved in for a long time, you know, uh, part of the uh, the Hacking Policy Council, which was one of the signatories to this to this particular letter or the people in that council, right? Um, I think specifically with CRA, you know, the, the, this whole idea of there being mandatory disclosure to governments of, of, of vulnerabilities, that that was the main thing that was a cause for concern. Um, <clears throat> I think any time the government's mandating that vulnerabilities go to a particular place, um, that creates risk. It creates you know the risk of, of you know potential misuse of, of that vulnerability information if it was found and 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 basically reported for defensive purposes. There's potential for it to be used for offensive reasons. Um, and, and there isn't necessarily a call out between you know, the downstream use of this information. Um, I think the more places a vulnerability uh, exists, 
um, you know, in general, the the like information wants to leak and get out, right? So the more places this sort of information exists, the more potential it has to actually be breached or compromised and, and to fall into the wrong hands. Um, and I think in general, one of the things that came up when we were when we were putting all of this together and, and working out, you know, the best response is, is just the potential for chilling effect on people that operate in good faith. You know, it, we've, we've gone from, as we just talked about before, this historical viewpoint of hackers always being the burglar and, and never the locksmith. And now we're shifting to this place where, you know, all of the information that hackers are trying to help out the internet with, you know, automatically going off to the government, that's, that has the potential to cause distrust and actually chill, you know, the willingness of hackers to participate in making the internet more secure in the first place. So those were some of the things that we called out in that letter. And yeah, that's kind yeah. of that. Uh, and your real concern is governments misusing this to, uh, for intelligence and surveillance purposes, um, without the people knowing what's going on. Yeah, and I think it's that last part that's really important. Um, you know, there isn't even really the acknowledgement of the potential for this stuff to be used defensively in in, in the CRA. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, if there was that acknowledgement, then there needs to be a call out of of there being you know some sort of vulnerability equities process. Um, in terms of how those decisions get made, like fundamentally, you know, my, my personal point of view is that being vulnerable is always bad, but exploits can mm. be used for good. You know, national security and, and, and surveillance to that end is an important function that government, governments need to have. So there's this weird balancing act that needs to be struck between, you know, those vulnerabilities being used for, for defense in terms of like just killing them off, getting them fixed and, and making the public more secure and, and the acquisition of intelligence capability. Yeah, of course, there is another aspect to this, not just what governments might do, but the whole um, area of vulnerabilities or zero days or whatever you want to call them is should they be should they be uh, made public in the first place? Because it gives if you say, you know, my software is we've got a vulnerability where that gives a an alert to all the bad hackers out there. Um, but on the other hand, if you don't, if you don't say you've got a vulnerability, then all your customers are going to say, well, you never told us. So how do you square that circle? Yeah, uh, it's, with great difficulty. I think, I think, you know, the idea of a vulnerability being published, um, to the, to the open internet before it's been fixed or before, uh, you know, even sometimes it's been like put in the right hands in terms of the people that can actually fix it and defend it. To me, I sort of see that as a like I don't like that phenomena, um, but I also don't like death and taxes very much. Like, it, it, like mm -hmm. to me, it's it's kind of more a function of the fact that, you know, that being a, a coordinated and a proactive process that can exist between security researchers and defenders. Like, we're still you know, there's been a ton of adoption of of what's called you know vulnerability disclosure programs (VDPs) over the past ten years, mm -hmm. and, and Buckrat's been kind of at the front of driving that. Um, but we're not done yet in terms of it being, you know, a de facto standard on the internet. And I think the idea of someone dropping, you know, a proof of concept or an exploit onto the internet to basically alert everyone to the risk that exists, that's a function of the failure of, of processes that could get that information into the right hands in a more orderly way. So it's a, you know, again, it's a interesting, it depends equities kind of answer. You know, I wish I had a perfect one, but I don't actually think one exists. No other than for companies just to realize that, you know, people write code, people aren't perfect. Sometimes those imperfections lead to vulnerabilities and you should plan ahead. I think the more organizations can adopt that posture of, of humility and then cooperation and collaboration with folks that want to help, I think the better we'll, we'll all be. I mean, it, we always tend to think of these vulnerabilities as being in mainstream commercial software, um, off the shelf stuff, but increasingly uh, companies are, have huge amounts of software they Create, develop themselves on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, it must be hard to find, well, first of all, find vulnerabilities and then disclose them when you're talking about perhaps one tiny little app that runs something or other in, in an organization. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, you know, when it comes to publishing vulnerabilities and making them widely or publishing, you know, exploits for vulnerabilities in particular and making them widely known, uh, normally that's, that's applied to you know, software that exists in many places, if that makes sense. Like if you're talking about, a, a, you know, bugcrowd.com, the platform, right? Like if there's a vulnerability in code that we wrote, it only really exists in one place. So if we yeah. find out about that and, and we fix it at that point in time, you know, the risk associated with that vulnerability kind of goes away. We actually still do vulnerability disclosure off the, off the back of that stuff because it's an educational yeah. transparency tool for us. But 
you know, you can sort of see the difference between that and, and a vulnerability in a phone, for example, that is is out there, you know, in the wild in, in you know, millions of millions of hands. Um, and each one of those users actually has to, you know, apply that patch for that for that system to be secure. It's kind of a different problem being solved there. So you're right, there are there are kind of different circumstances where this applies in different ways. Um, but you know, that's that's the beauty of the internet. I think it's it's kind of a complicated place and we're all trying to untangle it and, and make it work better and more safely for us as we go forward. Okay, so what um given that this this uh it's not it's not yet in gone through and passed, is it, or is it no? no so and, and I, th I think the other thing to call out with the CRA is that there are <clears throat> at this point in time um, different versions of it. Like there's different kind of departments working on the same document. It's it's um, definitely attracted you know a lot of interest from from policymakers trying to you know work out how to do it well, um, and, and obviously that's attracted interest and in, and in, in feedback from folk like myself from industry as well. So. Yeah, it hasn't gone through yet, and it is still very much a work in progress. I think. So, how would you, what what recommendations would you and the other experts uh, make uh, in relation to particularly Article Eleven? Um, what what would you like to see changed? Yeah, so the stuff that we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, in the letter itself. <clears throat> forgive me a sec here. <laughs> well, I clear my throat. Um, basically, extension of the disclosure window. Um, probably another thing to to, to note is that uh, you know the CRA at the moment, uh, some of the language that's being used in there uh, basically requires disclosure if there's known exploitation of that vulnerability on on the internet. So that's different to just knowing that a vulnerability is there, like knowing that it's there, bad guys know about it, and they're actually using it. Um, that obviously kind of it means that the information is already out there and in the hands of folks that are potentially malicious, but it also increases the urgency. Um, there was, you know, one piece in there where we talked about basically extending the window of disclosure from 24 hours to, to 72. <clears throat> and to me, that's mostly, um, frankly, it's a practical issue, you know, in, in, mm. in terms of actually understanding, you know, what the exploitation of that vulnerability looks like, what the vulnerability itself actually is, you know, what potential mitigations could be put in place and all that kind of stuff. Like if that happens to happen, if that happens to take place on a Friday afternoon, um, and you've got a 24 window, uh, 24 hour window for reporting, then <clears throat> that's going to create a challenge. Um, so that's that's one just very simple practical piece that's in there. And how how uh, risky are the vulnerabilities? Because to access the vulnerability, you've presumably got to hack into the organisation in the first place, unless there's a vulnerability, I suppose, with the access tools um do you, do you have any uh numbers on the the amount of attacks that are launched through vulnerabilities uh, in uh, cyber attacks i mean oh wow um <clears throat> you, you you're testing my uh, my knowledge of the latest breach reports and all that kind of stuff I don't no know, well, I, it doesn't it doesn't have to be accurate i just uh no i don't head, I, so. I don't have that uh i don't have that on hand accurately but there's things like the uh you know the verizon data breach report that comes yeah. out you know, annually, um, Buggrad does a report called Priority One that uh, is actually going to be dropping in in the next couple of months, um, where we talk about our, our observations around different you know trends of exploitation that that exist out there in the in the wild. I think you know in general, <clears throat> the main kind of threat actors that are taking advantage of these types of vulnerabilities at the moment, um, <clears throat> it kind of divides out into uh, into nation states. You, know, you see things like um, you know widespread exploitation of you know, VPN and remote access systems, um, you know, particular vendors, which I won't name and shame on, on this one, but it's, it's you know, you can do your research and figure out where the focus is on the bad guy side right now, but it's pretty wholesale. Like they're, they're going out and basically exploiting everything they can um, really with a view of getting persistence that they can use for things later on, uh, which yeah. is a bit of a shift in technique from nation states. Cause I think previous, like previously they, they'd focus on being quite stealthy and selective. In, in, in how they do exploitation. So that's one version of how vulnerabilities are being used in the wild. I think the other that's that's kind of on the ramp at the moment is um, <clears throat> basically a service layer in the cyber criminal uh, ecosystem called initial access brokers. So, so you know, at this point in time, I think uh, ransomware operators have taken a bit of a leaf from Silicon Valley and, and, and tried to, you know, build out service layers and, and kind of make a SaaS, you know, offering um, out, of, out of their criminal enterprise. 
And one of those layers is a group called IABs, initial access brokers, that literally do almost exactly the same as what I just described the nation states is doing. They'll, they'll go out and just get opportunistic access wherever they can, um, basically hold on to that and then actually sell that off to, uh, to huh. folks that can then deploy ransomware um, in, in marketplaces that exist on the dark web. So it's definitely- oh, That's fascinating. That's yeah. fascinating. So I, as a, as a not very good hacker, I could use these service guys to get me entry uh, and then do the stuff after that, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, as as someone who doesn't necessarily have, <clears throat> you know, if if you're a if you're a criminal operator um, who doesn't necessarily have access skills within their their crew, or you don't have them yourself, you know, there is now this option to basically go out and to and um, get the output of people that do have those skills and and connect what you've got available mm. as capability with with their access to go off and do your thing. So that's that started really ramping up during COVID, and it is a very big feature of of how yeah. you know, um, corporate exploitation is taking place today. Okay, so finally, yeah. I hear that you're going to be coming to London. Is that right? Uh, that's, soon? that's the plan. Yeah, yeah, we'll be out there for uh, you know, Bug Crowd will be out in force for Black Hat EU. Um, I'll okay. I'll be there myself. Um, so looking forward to uh, to you know being back on back on uh, UK soil, and uh, and getting about and seeing everyone there. So yeah, that, that's definitely the plan. Okay, well, hopefully I'll see you there. It's, it's November, isn't it? Um, December, so. uh, December, yeah. Oh, well, that helps, doesn't it? That yeah. I get the right month. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Casey, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Bye. Thanks Bye. so Bye. much. Thank All you, right. Thank you, Casey, for the interview. And thank you, Rose Ross from O Marketing, for arranging that. I'll be back next time with a report from Cyber Evolution, Covering the Coals Conference in Frankfurt, dedicated to cybersecurity and particularly with a focus on AI. I will be talking about software, software supply chain. So this issue that we've just been talking about is bound to come up. So hopefully might see you in Frankfurt if you're going. If not, I'll see you on the channel next time. So bye.